Halo 3 marked the highest peak of Bungie's Halo empire. Selling over 12 million copies worldwide, Halo 3 was the most successful Halo game of all time. However, Halo 3 was not the last Halo game created by Bungie. Yet when many legacy Halo fans are asked, what went wrong with Halo, they immediately lash out at the current owners of the Halo franchise, 343 Industries. Hey guys, it's the Tyrant here, and today we continue Halo The Rise and Fall with what may be the most controversial point in the series, when the decline of Halo truly began. Now before I move forward on this, and before you decide to hit that dislike button, and please don't, this video and the ones that follow from here on out are not reviews of the Halo games, nor am I saying that anything after Halo 3 should be considered bad. All I'm doing here is presenting you with facts. Whether you choose to believe it or not, after Halo 3, the series began moving in a different direction. In determining if the games after Halo 3 were good or not isn't something that I will be determining in this series, since how good or bad a Halo game is, is purely subjective, and I can't actually tell you whether a Halo game is good or not. It's up to you, the player. But if you remember in my last video, I stated that Halo 3 was the final game that only served to add and never subtract from a well-established franchise, and that is 100% true. And that's what Bungie's first mistake was moving beyond Halo 3. So let's take a second to look at the game that was next in line for Bungie, Halo 3 ODST. This may very well be one of my favorite games in the series, however this was the first Halo game that really stirred up any major controversy. You see, the main problem wasn't truly the game itself, but rather how it was marketed and sold. By today's standards, Halo 3 ODST would be considered an expansion, not a standalone game. It most likely would have been Xbox Live DLC set to a price between $20 to $30. However, in 2009, when the game was first released, it was marketed as a full game and sold at the price of one, $60. So let's take a step back for a second and define what most of us considered to be a full Halo game at the time. First off, a standard Halo game consists of a campaign that lasts between 5 to 7 hours of gameplay. However, Halo 3 ODST's campaign was just over 3.5 hours long, while also using the exact same models and engine as Halo 3. Again, the story itself was amazing. We got to experience the game from multiple perspectives and even got to choose the order of some of the missions via the game's main nighttime hub world of New Mombasa. But each mission, with the exception of the last two, was usually only about 10 minutes long. Alright, so time spent on the campaign was an issue, but what else makes a Halo game? For most players, the other half of a Halo game is its multiplayer. However, Halo 3 ODST lacked this aspect of a Halo game entirely. Sure, we'll take a second to acknowledge that the game did come up with a separate disc containing all of the maps from Halo 3, both original and downloadable content, and even gave us three new ones. And even though it was a smart idea on Bungie's part not to create an entirely new multiplayer experience to take away from Halo 3's current population, as well as hurt the next game, we still have to acknowledge that this was sold as a full Halo game without the standards that we usually are set to being one. Firefight, a new mode introduced in Halo 3 ODST that allowed players to fight endless waves of enemies was without a doubt one of the best new features of the game, and to this day remains to be what many consider the most iconic firefight experience in Halo. And while I personally very much enjoyed ODST's firefight mode, this was all you really had to play other than the uncharacteristically short campaign. The precedents set by previous Halo games, especially with all the features added in Halo 3, made ODST feel like a lesser game. One more marketing nitpick I had applies directly to Bungie.net itself. Remember when I mentioned in the last video that one of the things that made Halo 3 stand out the most was the overall community involvement? This was fairly easy considering we all had a central place to meet up and discuss our favorite Halo game, the Halo 3 forum on Bungie.net. But once ODST was released, an entirely new form was created for it. While some might argue this was a good move, it did have a noticeable impact on the numbers in the Halo 3 form. Arguably, the ODST form should have just been a part of the Halo 3 form since they both fell under the Halo 3 umbrella. But again, this was just something minor I noticed during the transition process. Alright, enough about the marketing aspect. Let's talk about the gameplay. As you recall, I stated that Halo 3 was the last game to never remove any major features. ODST, however, was the first game to do exactly this. Remove previously established features that we'd all become accustomed to. Now, at this point, I feel like I need to address that going into this, some of these changes were inherently accepted due to the nature of the game itself. 
we already knew right out of the box that we wouldn't be playing a super soldier this time around. And even as badass as ODSTs are, they're still just ordinary humans, and the game was set up to reflect that. On top of that, many of ODST's scenarios versus traditional Halo games were designed to be more stealth-like rather than guns blazing. The new silenced weapons made that very clear, along with the often dark and dreary environments that oftentimes required the player to utilize the new visor mode feature. But this also meant the removal of one of the most iconic weapons in the Halo games, the Battle Rifle. Even with the extreme effectiveness of the silenced pistol in ODST, this was a very noticeable change that annoyed many Halo players who were used to the steady bullet spread and well-rounded utility of the weapon. But that wasn't all. This was the first time that dual wielding had been removed as a feature entirely since Halo Combat Evolved. Even if it was a feature you the player only used occasionally, not having it around at all just felt weird. It's like living in a home with a dishwasher, and one day, it isn't there anymore. Sure, you don't technically need it, but it can save you a lot of time and trouble, and overall it can be a very useful thing to have around, especially in certain scenarios. Similar to the way regenerating shields and health were traded in for stamina and health packs, it's not necessarily that this made the game bad, but it was definitely something that we the players had to get used to after always having them around for the past five years. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we the players came to accept this for the simple reason that we weren't playing a Spartan this time around. We were playing an ODST, a normal human. But many of these features didn't just disappear for the duration of Halo 3 ODST. They stayed gone. That brings us to the final Halo game produced by Bungie, Halo Reach. This game is uniquely interesting in that you can ask a wide range of Halo players how they feel about Reach and read multiple reviews from websites across the internet, and opinions can vary wildly. Many people think this was the perfect swan song to Bungie's Halo universe, while others feel this was a major setback compared to the previous Halo installments, especially Halo 3. Now again, this video isn't set to determine whether or not Halo Reach is a good or bad game, or even a good or bad Halo game. All we're doing here is showing you how Bungie used this game to take Halo into a different direction, and it did. Halo Reach borrowed at least a couple of items of interest from Halo 3 ODST, despite the fact that we were once again playing Spartans. Now, lore-wise, you can argue that we were dealing with Spartan 3s, not Spartan 2s like the Master Chief, and I'd agree with you if future Halo games had actually brought back the concept of dual wielding, but they didn't. As in Halo 3 ODST, dual wielding was completely absent from the game, and once again, players were required to rely on health packs to retain their full strength, thereby slowing down the overall gameplay. After getting used to the previous system, this just felt off. We also saw the removal of what we had come to see as standard weapons, like the Covenant Carbine and the Beam Rifle, along with brute weapons and vehicles that had previously been introduced. They had been replaced with more unique weapons like the Needle Rifle and the Focus Rifle, and whether or not this was an improvement is 100% on you individually as the player. Personally, I enjoyed seeing less copies of weapons and having more unique tools at our disposal, but it doesn't change the fact that it felt like a pretty drastic change from what we were used to. But what are the more drastic changes fell to the art style and level designs? Up until this point, we never really viewed Halo as a realistic shooter game. It was always borderline cartoony, and that was part of its charm. Now, you may automatically associate that with the grunts, and that's certainly true, but even the menacing brutes and elites could be just as comical as they were intimidating. Halo Reach set out to give Halo a more realistic tone. The weapons were now a lot less sci-fi caricatures and more painted with a more realistic, gritty tone. The aliens, especially the elites, felt more stiff and less lifelike and alien-like than ever. And rather than the bright color palette we had grown accustomed to in previous Halo games, here the tone was much more matted and dreary. And look at the level design. Halo 3 reintroduced us to large, vast environments similar to what we experienced in Halo Combat Evolved, along with epic battles fighting alongside entire platoons of your fellow UNSC allies. But not only were the missions in Halo Reach generally much smaller in size and felt more scripted, finding allies to fight with you was an experience that was generally hard to come by as opposed to previous Halo games. You'd think with a planet like Reach getting attacked by the Covenant, we'd be seeing the biggest, most epic battles ever witnessed in a Halo game. And that brings us to my next point. Halo Reach was the first game to completely break what we'd always thought was canon to the franchise and further confuse players about Reach and its place in the Halo universe. 
You see, up until this point, everything we knew about Reach we read in the book Halo The Fall of Reach by Eric Nyland. And up until Halo Reach, we thought all of the books were supposed to be canon to the Halo universe and only served to expand an already amazing story. But several plot points of Halo Reach, including the Covenant arriving earlier than we thought, the complete lack of a UNSC space fleet, and more jarringly, the presence of Cortana towards the end of the game, which completely derailed our current understanding of Reach, its importance in the Halo universe, and whether or not we could even trust the material outside of the games at all. It brought a sense of betrayal. When the conflicting plot points were brought to Bungie's attention by the fans, originally they stated that the books were in fact not canon until they later re-released Eric Nyland's The Fall of Reach to incorporate some of the retcons brought on by the game. This was a major slap in the face for longtime Halo fans. But it wasn't the only confusing aspect of Reach. It was the first and only game to have campaign, multiplayer, and firefight all on one disc, as well as matchmaking for all three modes. And on the surface, that sounds pretty amazing, and in many ways it was. However, nearly all of the initial firefight and multiplayer maps were ripped directly from campaign. Those that weren't were created in Forge World, a gigantic Forge map created so that fans could let their creativity run wild. And that should have been for the fans, not the developers. As a result, there was very little variation from one mode to the next. Now I'm going to present you with a challenge. I want you to think of one of the first three Halo games and name at least three of your favorite multiplayer maps. It's easy, right? Each map had its own unique style and setting to the point where many maps were remade for other games. They became fan favorites. What comes to mind when you think of Halo Combat Evolved? You're probably thinking of maps like Blood Gulch, Sidewinder, Battle Creek, and Hang'em High. What about Halo 2? Coagulation, Lockout, Midship, and Headlong, right? Okay, now Halo 3. Valhalla, Last Resort, The Pit, and of course my favorite map, Avalanche. Now let's try this with Halo Reach. Um, hmm. Reach's version of Blood Gulch? Now apparently the true name of that map is called Hemorrhage, but I actually had to look that up before making this video. It isn't as easy for Reach as it is for the other games, is it? That should tell you something. I'm not saying that Reach's maps were bad, I'm just saying it seems lazy, doesn't it? Like, not as much effort went into making the game? That it didn't receive the same love and attention to detail that was given to the other games? And it wasn't just the maps, either. It was the way they were played. Equipment from Halo 3 was botched in favor of the new armor ability system. This may have caused the biggest stir in the community. Jetpacks and Sprint felt completely alien when it came to Halo. No pun intended there. Or at least that felt like the case back then. An armor lock? Yeah. No matter which side of that argument you take, be prepared to fight off an entire army of people who think you are flat out wrong. On top of that, a lot of the game types included the concept of loadouts, which almost entirely removed the concept of classic map control that we all knew and loved. And whether you like this particular feature or not, you could no longer be an elite multiplayer, with of course the exception of the invasion game type, and even then, it all depended on which side you were on. And that's when I realized something. Something that hadn't really crossed my mind before. All the way up to Halo 3, one of the main ways you could tell just how important and how much of an impact Halo was came in the way of how other games tried to copy it. I mean, think about it. Once Halo became a global sensation, more games began using the two-weapon system, faction-based enemies, and worked harder to create more driving plots for their games. Halo was a trendsetter, and it really wasn't until the days of Halo 3 that Halo began to have any real competition. But by the time Halo Reach rolled around, things began moving in the other direction. Halo began borrowing concepts from other games instead of creating their own. This was perhaps the biggest and most jarring turning point in the series. Halo was beginning to lose ground to other games. I guess that's what happens when you build such a successful brand for yourself. People see it, study it, and perfect it. And once they have, it allows them more freedom for innovation and new and awesome things to incorporate into the gaming world. It's not easy to think of Reach that way, is it? I mean, this was supposed to be Bungie's swan song to the fans, and maybe in their own way it was. Maybe letting up on the reins a bit allowed an easier transition for 343 Industries, giving them lots of options to improve the Halo Reach experience. And they did. They gave us a classic playlist that featured no more armor abilities or loadouts, and included several different remakes of classic maps from previous Halo games. 
It made Reach feel more like Halo again. And whether all this was intentional or not, that's an answer I don't have and may never have. But one thing is for certain, this is a major turning point for the Halo franchise. For better or worse, Halo was changing, adapting to the world around it. It went from feeling like an industry leader and pioneer to slowly beginning to blend in with the rest of the crowd. And while I also believe that these issues could have been addressed in the future, what happened to Halo over the course of ODST and Reach was far from being the most devastating. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next video. The single mode earth shattering event to happen in the history of Halo. The event that shook the entire Halo community to its very core. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you're enjoying the series and are able to take away some useful information out of each and every installment. But remember, what makes these videos even more important is hearing from all of you, the fans. So tell me what your own thoughts were about Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach. In fact, better yet, tell me what your first Halo game was and what pulled you into the franchise. You can let me know in the comments below as well as on Facebook and Twitter. If you aren't already following me on social media, I'd love to hear from you. You can find links to my social media sites in the description below. And if you like this video, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more video game related content every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We were a little late on the Friday video this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday, so I do apologize for that. But I'll see you all right back here on MythicTyrant.com to brighten your Monday. Have a great holiday weekend, everyone. And as always, I'm the Tyrant, signing off.